Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CARE Conference 2022, The Impact of Community-Led Approaches. I'm Adam Riley, Prevention Manager with CARICOL. And before we get started today, I just have a few uh, housekeeping slides to go through. So first, uh, CARICOL, we are Cincinnati, Greater Cincinnati's HIV services organization devoted to positively changing lives in the fight against HIV through prevention, housing, and care. For more information, visit caracol.org. And to participate in today's meeting, use the uh, chat function for technical questions or to introduce yourself or share information. But if you have questions specifically for our presenter today, please use the Q&A function as shown on this slide. And if you're joining us from a mobile device today, you can still access the chat by clicking the three dots more button at the bottom right of your screen or clicking the white Q&A button at the top right of your screen. And thank you to our sponsors. Presenting partner today is Maytech, Maytech, Midwest AIDS Training and Education Center at the University of Cincinnati, and AETC, the AIDS Education and Training Center, with sponsorship from Gilead. We are offering continuing education credits for today's session. To be eligible for those credits, you must attend for 60 minutes and complete your evaluation by 5 p.m. today. The link to the evaluation will be shared throughout the session in the chat, and you can also access the QR code to get you to that evaluation in the PDF uh, program for the conference. We are not offering CMEs today, uh, as we did for other ones, we're just offering the continuing education credits. And with that, we'll move on to today's presentation. Before we get to our presenter, I am pleased to introduce the 76th mayor of the city of Cincinnati, Mayor Aftab Pureval. Thank you for being here, Mayor. Thanks, Adam. Thanks so much for having me. Good afternoon, CARA Conference community. Thank you again so much for letting me join this vitally important event. As, as this past week of conversations with experts and advocates has demonstrated, there is just an incredible and truly inspiring network of people working to support for those living with HIV. And I'm so glad that events like this exist for our community. Public and community health workers share knowledge, uh, discussing the evidence-based strategies that have worked in public health this is exactly what progress looks like. And thanks to all of you, we are move, moving towards a world with improved information, decreased stigma, and better outcomes, most importantly. On behalf of the entire city of Cincinnati, I wanna thank Caracol for all their hard work to end the HIV epidemic. They are a crucial community asset for our Cincinnatians living with or at risk for HIV. And I couldn't be prouder of the mission that they work uh, towards every single day. Today's conversation with Maria Bruno is at its core about civil rights, about how our community protects the rights of all of our citizens and how strong communal advocacy helps create a healthier community for not just some of us, but for all of us. Because we know far too often, right here in Ohio and across the country, those rights are at risk. And, and we see tragically the repercussions of stigma and prejudice up close. This conversation, this work is about putting an end to that and acting as a champion for those who've been pushed to the margins. I'll just close by thanking you all again for being here, for using your voice to challenge inequities and injustice wherever and whenever you see it. I'm extremely grateful to be a part of this conversation. And now we'll kick it back to the rest of the conversation, starting with Maria Bruno. Thank you so much, Mayor Aftab. I have to admit, when I found out you were introducing me, I was really excited about it because we had never had the opportunity to meet, and I am so grateful for your work and your allyship. Um, I'm Maria Bruno. My name, uh, I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. I'm the Public Policy Director at Equality Ohio, and I'm going to talk a little bit today just about the overall legislative landscape that we all have been working uh, with over these last very... Uh, very long and and pr frankly pretty dramatic, I'm sure for all, all the folks on this call as well, um, lawmaking process. There's a lot of bills, there's a lot of um, changes. So we're just gonna kind of talk about that and ways that you all um, can get involved, but also just why you might care about all of this happening. 
So Equality Ohio, if anyone is unfamiliar with us, we are a statewide uh, advocacy and education organization that works for the lived and legal equality for LGBTQ people in the state of Ohio. Uh, we do advocacy, we do policy work, we uh, offer a legal clinic to low income folk, uh, LGBTQ folks in the state of Ohio, and we provide public education programming, uh, including doing presentations like this one. Um, next slide, please. So around the country, we've been seeing a lot of headlines related to LGBTQ people and how they've been targeted uh, by politicians over these last few years. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. First, we have the Title IX guidance that was issued from President Biden. And I, I actually, I submitted these slides about a month ago, um, and there's sort of some up uh, breaking news as of this week about uh, Ohio's situation related to Title IX guidance. But long story short, um, the there was a legal case called Bostock that basically uh, explicitly said that discrimination on the basis of sex includes gender identity and um, sexual orientation. And Title IX guidance and case law related to it has been similarly decided. Everyone um, has determined in the courts that, uh, generally speaking, that sex-based discrimination includes uh, LGBTQ identity, which means that programming, things that get federal funding related to education, um, they must have non-discrimination uh, boundaries in place and abide by the general non-discrimination protections outlined in the federal Title IX, which includes for LGBTQ uh, Ohioans. Now, the update here is that we, we just at this week got a resolution introduced, or there is going to be a resolution introduced on Tuesday uh, at our state board of education that essentially says, we don't agree with this interpretation and we encourage school districts to just ignore this. And we encourage the state to provide funding to those schools who might lose federal resources for ignoring these non-discrimination protections, specifically regarding transgender uh, individuals. So it's pretty horrible. We are organizing around it. I can you know, send some links to Adam so he can help circulate. But uh, if you are interested in testifying about that, it is due this Sunday at 5 p.m. And you can go to Honesty for Ohio Ed for an action link. Again, this wasn't in the presentation because it hadn't happened yet, but I did want to mention it. Next slide, please. So similarly, um, our HHS has introduced guidance. And again, these are kind of wonky slides uh, that hopefully will be shared with you all so you can click the links and actually take time to read that. But the general just is the same. Non-discrimination protections includes LGBTQ people. And specifically, this is re with regard to providing transgender affirming health care. Um, this is, of course, in response to Texas having those very, very horrible uh, health care bans that they put in place this year related to transgender affirming care for, for young people. Next slide, please. Yeah, so around 20 state attorney general, attorneys general are suing these federal agencies, uh, not those two actually, uh, well, the US Department of Education and Title IX is one thing. So um, that basically is, again, saying that, say, making the same argument as the resolution I just mentioned, that the non-discrimination laws, including LGBTQ people, is incorrect and uh, should be reversed. Um, the resolution explicitly endorses that lawsuit. They also endorse the next lawsuit, which is related to USDA, um, which they uh, similarly, have that if you are part of the food program for uh, free school lunches, essentially, um, you have to abide by the non-discrimination standards, including LGBTQ people. They are suing under the same theory that they shouldn't have to abide by those non-discrimination protections to receive this federal assistance. Um, so they are essentially uh, holding children's lunches hostage uh, to, to fight for the right to discriminate against LGBTQ people. It's, it's really pretty heinous. Next slide, please. We've also seen a lot of um, sports policy changes. This is just, again, <laughs> again these, these uh, situations are so constantly changing, it's hard to actually have slides that are up to date. And so this Sports Illustrated article is a, from probably a few months ago at this point, but they did a really good job of outlining the different um, requirements for transgender athlete participation in various sports leagues. So if you're ever interested in learning more about that, that's where you can find it. Next slide, please. 
And then there's been a lot of state house nonsense um, around the country and here in the state. We have seen uh, politicians target LGBTQ youth in a variety of ways. And I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Next slide, please. So first, you've heard, I'm sure, about the transgender athlete bans around the US. Um, and uh, basically, the bills are modeled after uh, one sort of template. So they're all very similar, but they all do have some slight variations. Um, but you can see that 31 states, no, 33 states, or 32, sorry, math is hard. Uh, 31 plus one is 32. 32 states have uh, similar laws related to transgender athlete bans introduced, not necessarily passed, some have passed, but uh, many are just like Ohio introduced or partway through the lawmaking process. Um, there's already lawsuits in West Virginia and Idaho and uh, all over the country, we have seen LGBTQ people, specifically youth, be attacked. Over 250 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced uh, in 2021 and over a hundred of those are anti-transgender bills. Next slide, please. So um, 18 have actually passed the law. Thank you, no, that's fine. Uh, 18 have passed the law. That is another link that just has a good summary. It was hard to keep track. I believe the link is from April. So some of it actually might at this point be out of date, but it has all of the states in one place, which uh, there weren't many places that kind of had that sort of neatly consolidated and just broken down really quickly. Next slide, please. Um, so here in Ohio, uh, we've had a few bills that have come up related to transgender athlete bans. Um, you will hear them referred to by their proponents as the Save Women's Sports Act, and you will hear it uh, referred to by opponents as the General Inspection Bill. And this is a lesson in political messaging. This is, <laughs> um, you know, part of the fight is which name do you go with when you talk about the bill? And it has a big impact on how that bill ends up being viewed in the general public. Um, but the reason that it's uh, being called the genital inspection bill is because it includes invasive genital medical and genetic chest, uh, checking for my, of minors to, quote, verify their gender. Um, they, that means um, a DNA test or, and or a physical inspection of inner or outer sexual or organs, aka genital inspection. Um, and so you're either uh, basically forcing these athletes to have costly medical bills that no one else will cover uh, or a literal general inspection. Um, it directly goes after Ohio High School Athletic Association and NCAA's policies because these, these policies already exist. There have been regulations related to transgender participation and use in um, school sports for uh, since 2015. And there has not been issues related to it until this became a political platform for folks. Um, and so we, oh, and the other thing to note about this bill is that anyone can challenge it. Any person can decide they're going to go to a track meet and point to a girl and say, I don't think that's a girl, prove it. And then you have to go through these very scientifically inaccurate. We know how gender actually works. It's a spectrum, of course. Uh, but they try to make science where there isn't any and um, basically have all of these sort of physical um, attributions that they must meet. But the thing is also those are not defined in the bill. So it's really unclear what is going to count sufficiently. So it's just, it's a mess for a variety of reasons. Um, the sponsors of these bills are Jenna Powell, Reggie Stolfis, and Christina Rogner in the Senate side. Um, and then we also had HB 151, which is, this is another lesson in lawmaking. Um, in the final moments of session, before uh, the, le the state legislators went on recess for the summer, on the House floor, an, an amendment was introduced to a, a completely unrelated bill to shove the language from SB 132 into this into that bill. The bill was innocuous and bipartisan. It was something related to, I think, like mental health care or like coach funding. Like it was something that isn't really very controversial. And they shoved this in at the last moment, made it, making it a partisan uh, bill. And they did it on the House floor. And the reason that that is so kind of, I think, a dirty play, frankly, is that the 
traditional lawmaking process is amendments and such are happen uh, with discussion time and with opportunity for public comment, which actually occurs at the at the um, committee level. And so once a bill is actually passed at a committee and going onto the floor, um, it should kind of already have its main its main components. It's certainly the nature of the bill should not change in the final moments before it passes. And so it was a really sneaky way to pass that bill. Now know that it only passed in the House side, it still has to go through the whole Senate side. Senate's not coming back until mid-November. It is not law, um, but it is just really just concerning that they just tried to bypass the whole public comment portion of that lawmaking. Next slide, please. There are lots of other bad bills in the state happening right now. Um, there, there are anti quote anti CRT bills. Uh, don't say gay. You might hear us refer to them as the don't say gay, don't mention race bills. You also might hear us refer to them as curriculum censorship. These are all the same batches of bills. They're so horrible. There are a million different ways to frame how horrible they are. Uh, don't say gay, don't mention race is the simple uh, off the tongue one. But um, but yeah, they they are pretty terribly vague bills that are designed to scare teachers out of broaching any conversation related to gender identity or uh, really anything related to race. Then with the trans sports ban we just discussed, uh, other attacks to bodily autonomy, uh, trans medical health care ban, I discussed those uh, very briefly as well, and the attacks to abortion access. Um, a lot of folks are like, that's not an LGBTQ issue. And the thing is, it is, though, because um, the, the, the legal precedent that is created through abortion rights is both the basis for uh, LGBTQ marriage equality, as well as transgender health care access, because the boundary that they are trying to draw in these laws is that the state has the right to enter your medical care um, decision-making process and decide which valid medical treatments you have uh, control over actually having or not having access to. And once you start doing that for any category, whether it's transgender healthcare, whether it's abortion access, you are dealing with a situation where now the state is allowed to do that um, and they can do that for anything then. Um, so it really is directly tied, these, these abortion access bills are directly tied to LGBTQ um, equality because it is all founded in that right to privacy and that right from government intrusion. Um, and then finally, we also have tax, a tax to democracy and protest bills, voting rights, those also might seem pretty uh, tangential, but they're not. Um, the LGBTQ mo movement was defined and began through a gigantic protest movement. Um, we know how important protest movements are to creating social change. We saw that in 2020 with the George Floyd protest as well. Um, public power is a very important component to democracy at large. And if we don't have components of democracy protected, we can't do any of the other things. We can't guarantee any rights if we don't have a democratic system in place. And that, so that's the same reason that we also see election and voting rights bills as, as up our alley because it is a foundational component of us being able to fight about the other stuff. Next slide, please. The reasons you all might care, um, other than just you know basic empathy and um, you know recognizing the importance of a right to privacy, is that they are specifically and more frequently invoking licensure requirements into these uh, bad quote culture war bills. Um, they are trying to basically create uh, licensure related penalties for folks who don't follow these laws and also requirements for obtaining those licensures um, and uh, continuing education credits. I mean, they're creeping in in a variety of different ways related to actual occupational um, disruptions uh, to make sure that their, their uh, laws are not just theoretical, but actually have an impact. And unfortunately, that impact is going to be on practitioners that actually provide these, these services. Um, these extreme legislation, you all know, it leads to tangible harm. It leads to tangible harm for folks who are probably your patients and clients. Um, it leads to tangible harm for all of us, really. So um, the other thing is discrimination is bad for business. I know that that, you know, it, it almost feels weird to bring it back to business, but it's true. I mean, as an economy, as a, as a state that wants a healthy economy, 
being inviting to potential businesses as well as existing businesses and uh, organizations and events and all of these things. Uh, being inviting is a really important uh, component of people investing in our state. And so if we are the state, increasingly so, that is the, the state where you, you know, LGBTQ people can't go to school and be out, or the state that doesn't have access to transgender uh, medical care for youth. I mean, these are things that are genuinely bad for talent recruitment and um, event um, bids in all sorts of different ways. It actually does in impact our economy substantially. Um, and then protecting kids means protecting their right to exist authentically and have a safe learning environment. Um, school is really important and it matters a lot and it determines a lot about your life trajectory and everyone should just be able to sort of uh, find out who they are along the way of growing up without facing constant harassment from adults through these legislations. Next slide, please. So the goals for a lot of these bills is often slow it down. Um, the thing about stopping bad legislation that's different than pushing for good legislation, it's a lot less rewarding because the fruits of your labor is something not happening. Um, and it's hard to celebrate the absence of something happening. And so you don't get that, you know, hooray moment the same way when you defeat bad bills. You just have to kind of take solace and know that you just stopped something really terrible from happening to your community. And so um, often the way that we do that is we just help the folks who are somewhere in the middle, who see that they see that we have a point but they think the other side might have a point too. And we try to talk to those folks and appeal to their better angels and disrupt misinformation, which is rampant, especially around our issues. Um, give them good information, have them be in a room with someone with lived experience and actually talk to them and um, you know, do your best to create a safe environment where the legislator can ask colorful questions, not, you know, genuinely kind spirited questions, but maybe that aren't worded perfectly, or um, that is something that you wouldn't ask in a public space. Um, but having the opportunity to have those conversations either with professionals or with the people with lived experience themselves, it, it really can change minds, it can stop bills. We have had so many conversations with um, moderate Republicans who are frustrated that they keep having to talk about these bills that also to them seem nonsensical. And also they have a lot of political pressures to uh, at a minimum, just stay out of the way. And so we have to give them really good reasons to get back in the way. And often um, just a few folks that are in the way in the right places can slow a bill down and get us to the time that expires because after at the end of legislative session, so this year that will be at the end of December, they're two years long. and. So at the end of December, every bill that is currently on our um, you know, pending bills gets wiped off and we start over. Now, a lot of them will be introduced again right away. So it's not to say that we've defeated them all, but we live to fight another day. And that is often when you are in a state where people are trying to do really harmful things, that is often the main goal. And so you can correct misinformation. You can isolate the sponsors of bad bills. That's something that we do a lot. And what, what we basically mean is, it sounds really cynical, but the truth is when I'm assessing political sort of movement, I am assuming that every politician is acting in entirely self-interest. What is best for me politically? What gets me in office longer? What allows me to take the office up if I want to you know, go to a higher office? And frankly, it's pretty reliable predictor method. Um, so you want to make the sponsors of these terrible bills toxic because if they're toxic, then no one wants to sit there with their hand or their arm around them. I mean, you know, if, if this person is seen as a cruel person who is bullying children, the folks who are somewhere in the middle have a lot harder of a time glad handing them. And again, when the goal is to slow things down, that can be a really helpful strategy. Also give lawmakers justifications to take back to their voters. This is cynical, I understand. It's also the nature of politics that 
when lawmakers are deciding their own moral benchmarks, they're also deciding how their voters are going to feel. And frankly, that's not necessarily a bad thing. They're there to represent their their voters. Um, they're there to represent their constituency, and that includes forwarding the wish of their of their voters. And so you do have to help them explain it to their voters, explain why this is not against everyone's values. And frankly, there's usually, there's pretty much always a way to do that. Um, a good example is what we just talked about with the business. A lot of the moderate Republicans will say, look, I'm not really taking a position on this issue. I'm just saying this will be bad for business. And as someone who cares about business, I think it, it would be a bad move. Um, and again, we would love for the all of the reasoning and justifications to be grounded in empathy and um, support. But I will take a business interest if it gets a bad law from not passing. And sometimes you have to help that lawmaker find those points. We have a whole fact sheet that's just about transgender youth in sports um, using conservative values as a framework. And none of it's it none of it's dishonest. We talk about government boundaries. We talk about um, fiscal irresponsibility. I mean, the language might be different, but, but it's still true. And so a lot of the times and when professionals are able to point that out, um, folks who are just through the regular course of business going to interact with this bad law, having them say this is going to be bad is very powerful to those lawmakers who really do want to avoid doing harm to the state. Next slide, please. So yes, the main point is to stop the bill. And the mere introduction also has a harm. And that harm is not entirely intangible. There are uh, real world impacts because often what it means is that lo um, local lawmakers or um, school administrators or other people feel empowered by the introduction, either because they, they read a headline and assume it's already law or because it gave them an idea and it made them feel um, galvanized to actually act in a way congruent with the, the, um, the bill. Next slide, please. And here's the wrong assumptions that get forwarded through all of these bills. Attack on LGBTQ plus youth. Whenever you're saying that we can't talk about sexual orientation, we can't let transgender youth participate in sports, we are often using a foundational sort of assumption that a queer identity is inherently perverse or sexual, that there's something inherently wrong with talking about um, sexual orientation when you're talking about LGBTQ people as opposed to when you're talking about Cinderella kissing Prince Charming. Queer related educational topics are predatory. This is a big, this is the groomer language we've heard a lot of. I mean, this isn't, that's incredibly harmful. I was at a school board meeting this week where people were yelling pedophile at teachers for supporting LGBTQ youth. Um, it is not great out there right now. And I'm sure many of you all know that already, but um, the similarly by including um, race in this discussion as well, they're also, you know, presuming that discussion of race or culture is inherently divisive. Um, that's not a great way to look at the world. Um, you know, there is a lot of value and learning that can be done through sharing different um, points of views and cultures and um, just historical experiences, lived experiences in general. And there's nothing divisive about that. Being, being uh, recognizing differences doesn't mean making divides. And so they're the ones that continue to make this a divisive topic, but the assumption when they are talking about these bills is often that just bringing up race is a controversial, is a divisive way to approach discussion. And they also assume that non-white, non-hetero, non-Christian, um, non-cis, you know, are all inherently ide uh, divisive identities, same way as race, that um, there's something about mentioning that you are not white or not a Christian that is harmful. And of course, that is not how the world works as far as a lot of us can tell. 
attacks on bodily autonomy, the assumptions that are what I talked about, one, you know, the line between the healthcare and the government is a really important one to protect. And so the assumption is that these lawmakers who are not medical professionals, um, maybe one or two are, and often the one or two are, are the ones that are not in favor of these bills, um, that they know better than the individuals themselves what the care they need, and also their doctors who study this and do this on a daily basis. It's not, it's not a, uh, logical thing to say that the lawmakers are going to do the, a better job than the folks who are charged with doing no harm for their patients. And someone else's religious views has anything to do with your own health care. Um, it just doesn't. It doesn't. And so these attacks to bodily autonomy on the grounds that, um, you know, my faith tells me, that's great. Awesome. <laughs> and I don't share that faith. Or maybe I do, and I interpret it a whole lot differently than you do. Um, that is something that isn't relevant to how I get my medical care or um, what I do in my bedroom or who I spend my life with. And then attacks to democracy. Um, same thing as, as I mentioned before, that uh, the foundational principle of democracy is that we have the right to choose who represents us and that we have the right to speak up. And when we put arbitrary limits on that, the, the presumption is that we don't have that right, and it's wrong. Next slide, please. On the ground, we're already seeing this manifest itself. Um, as I mentioned, just the introduction can actually be a um, taken as a free pass for folks who want to do bad things. And so we've already seen that in action. We've seen literally rainbows be banned in the classroom. I mean, it's ridiculous. And also it has really happened in Ohio. All of these stories, I think at this point you can Google and find out. Um, a teacher was fired for handing out pride bracelets. He was wearing one himself uh, because he himself is a member of the local pride organization. He was asked about it by students. The students said, oh, those are great. I want one. He brought some in for them. And then he was relieved of his position. Um, there were two plays, there was the same play, which name is, I'm forgetting, but um, it alluded to one of the characters being gay. And that play was canceled for, from two different school productions on the grounds that a character was alluded to being gay. Um, and then a teacher was actually punished for ask, asking for pronouns. And increasingly, we are actually seeing policies against them more formally, just um, basically saying prohibiting asking for pronouns. And get this, sometimes the rationalization is because you are asking them something related to sexual content. Like they're, they're trying to say that asking someone's pronouns is like akin to talking about sex, um, which is just bizarre to me. Next slide, please. But it's not all bad. I won't leave you totally depressed about all of the things that are happening because there are some good things happening too. Next slide. We do have some good bills that are um, being considered right now at the state house and that continue to gain support. We have Ohio, the Ohio Fairness Act, which would provide statewide non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ folks in housing, employment, and public accommodation. Um, we have passed local versions of these non-discrimination protections in I think over 35 uh, localities at this point. Um, so even while the state sort of uh, stalls, we are continuing to make pro progress as far as uh, actual territory on the state being covered by a non-discrimination protection. Uh, we also work at the federal level for that. Um, but I will tell you, I mean, when we meet with these, again, these moderate Republicans, they're frustrated that we're not moving the Fairness Act. This is very much a bipartisan um, desire to pass Ohio Fairness Act um, because, again, it's, it's good for business. It's smart. And a lot of people really do know someone and love someone who is themselves LGBTQ and deserves a fair, safe environment to work, live, and have access to. We're also working on HIV modernization efforts. Um, that is basically to decriminalize the um, status-based offense of having HIV. And what that means, I know uh, there was a presentation about it from my um, colleague, Kim, I think yesterday or the day before, um, that's the day before, I think, about these um, some of the HIV laws that currently exist around this. So this effort would be to modernize those laws to remove status-based offenses. 
you can if you are arrested for solicitation, just the mere having HIV is an upcharge, which means it goes from a misdemeanor to a felony. And this reform would just remove the part where merely having HIV itself is a criminal offense, uh, is an upcharge, is a criminal component. Um, because, of course, when these laws were passed, one, there was a whole lot of moral judgment to folks who had contracted HIV, um, obviously unjustified um, discrimination. There's no other word for it. It was discrimination against folks with HIV. And the other reason is because science and our knowledge of HIV has dramatically improved. And so now we know about uh, undetectable and untransmittable. Now we know that someone can safely live their life, even engage in sexual activity without transmitting HIV. Now we have to teach the rest of, the, of our community that we've learned this and that this is important and that uh, these modern, these offenses never made sense, but they extra, extra, extra don't make any sense given the science and the treatment options that we currently know. Um, so we are drafting amendments right now. We are continuing to talk, talk to lawmakers about getting this together. We already have some bipartisan interest in um, working with us on this because everyone sees this for what it is, which is a practical change uh, that reflects modern, uh, what takes away a, a harm from the past as well as reflects modern technology and science. Um, and we also are working on conversion therapy ban. There's one at the state level. There's also um, several local ordinances. Um, we, I don't have the account off the top of my head, but the same way we are doing non-discrimination protections, we are uh, doing conversion therapy bans with uh, local partners around the state. Next slide, please. The Ohio Fairness Act, as I mentioned, I just wanna go over it uh, quickly because this is something that uh, we have worked on for like 15 years and we really just wanna get this over the finish line. A lot of people assume that LGBTQ people already have non-discrimination protections in housing, employment and public accommodations. We do not. Um, but as we discussed earlier with the Title IX guidance, discrimination on the basis of sex has continued to legally in courts, even by conservatives, include gender identity and sexual orientation. And if anyone's confused by this, I think one thing to note about the case law, one, we talked about the right to privacy, but the other thing is uh, when you think about quote cross-dressing, a, um, a lot of the foundational sort of case law related to this was like a, ma a man got in trouble for wearing a dress. And inherently there was a tie between uh, gender expression and with um, this um, discrimination that they were facing for specifically their gender expression um, and failing to conform to gender norms. And so the tie between sex and gender is inherent and um, that is why it is part of non-discrimination protections under on the basis of sex. I think that that allows a, like a much more linear picture of like, oh yes, that's right. When people don't adhere to social norms, that's often because uh, they are gender um, gender diverse or uh, non-conforming. And so it makes sense that those are inherently linked. Relig religious exemption, there are religious exemptions in this. And the, the short answer is to like what that means is basically if someone is conducting an activity that is related to their religious exercise, that means, you know, a, a, a mass, a, uh, a an event at the church to, um, you know, teach kids about the, their religion, whatever it might be. Those are inherently religious activities. Those are not covered under um, gender discrimination. And what that means is like, Catholics can't have women priests and, you know, whatever. So um, there is that carve out for those religions when it is religious activity. Now, we also have religious institutions that do wonderful charitable work around the state. They have homeless shelters. They have a food pantry. They have a hospital. Those folks, when you are providing a public service or a public accommodation more, more directly, um, that you have to, would still have to abide by those non-discrimination protections. You could not uh, not give food to someone on the basis that they are themselves LGBTQ. There's nothing inherent about giving food to someone that is a religious activity. Um, that is a public accommodation and therefore these laws would, um, would qualify. Next slide, please. 
So HIV modernization, um, the current law, as I mentioned, has um, status offenses. And basically the two things that we really are tweaking in all of these laws to remove, um, remove the status-based element. You, you can't just be charged because you have HIV. You have to intend to actually transmit HIV, not intend to engage in, in intercourse or contact or you know whatever it might be, um, and intend to transmit it, intend to give it to someone else, as well as actual transmission. You have to actually have given it to them. There actually has to be a harm. Um, that is when any upcharge related to spreading a communicable disease would continue to apply. But if there, if if you are, um, you know, particularly if you are undetectable, untransmittable, um, that obviously shows zero intent to transmit HIV, which means that these laws uh, would not apply to people who are just living their lives and happen to have HIV. Next slide, please. Conversion therapy ban, it, um, it would ban conversion therapy, which is the process of trying to talk someone out of being gay or transgender or otherwise gender nonconforming. Um, it's therapy that has been condemned by all major medical uh, associations. We've had a lot more luck with our local ordinances than we have at the state level. I'll just level with you. Um, but it, it, because it's already been condemned by medical associations, it's, it's truly not therapy. It is um, something that is done by community groups um, outside of any medical profession, but because the word therapy is in their word for it, there is kind of a misconception that this is based on good science and it's just, that's not the case. Next slide, please. And the Equality Act is pretty much the federal version of the Fairness Act, so I just went over that. Um, but we are continuing to push for this, and it would have similar religious carve-outs, and it would mean um, discrimination on the basis of sex would explicitly, by code, not just by case law, include gender identity and sexual orientation. And as we know, we've learned that codifying things is really important to protect them. Um, court court uh, opinions aren't what they used to be. Um, and so this would codify that. And, and it is important to have these at the state and federal level. They often have different um, procedural mechanisms for actually enforcing the law, um, different um, boundaries for them. So they are slightly different, um, but so it, ideally we have both state and federal protections. Next slide, please. So we also, as I mentioned, participate in a lot of advocacy that isn't directly LGBTQ issues like voting and things that we mentioned already. Um, when we are in those spots, this is where it's really kind of important to play well in the sandbox. And, you know, we're not the subject experts, nor do we want to be. Uh, no one has capacity for that. And so really what that means is being a good partner, elevating the work that other partners in your community doing this work all the time are doing. Be part of a chorus. Uh, you know, this is an occasion where you're not the one circulating the sign on letter, you're just the one signing on all you got to do is sign your your org name right like so sometimes it really is just being a willing participant in the, in the chorus and. Um, you know, being that good partner and I have seen in many situations us doing that has reaped benefits in the future, because when we have the sign on letter when we have a partner ask they're like great you did it for us. We're going to do it for you. And it becomes this really great partnership that is intersectional and allows all of us to elevate each other's work and our own work um, and let the experts lead you and just tell you where you're best utilized. I think the number one mistake for people who are new to community organizing, and I was actually just talking about this the other day, um, they say, I want to help, I want to help. And, and people say, great, do this. And they go, I don't really want to do that. I want to help. <laughs> There's a reason that we asked for that specific thing because we thought about where you can be most useful and that's what we landed on. And um, you can do whatever, right? Like that's the great thing about advocacy and organizing. But I think there, uh, there's no use being prideful about this isn't exactly what I was hoping to do because the logic is often based on a much larger picture. For instance, for this resolution I've mentioned, um, we're trying to get people to show up in person we're trying to get people to submit testimony. We're trying to get people to make phone calls. Now, if someone decides they want to organize a protest on Wednesday to, you know, oppose this resolution, great. Obviously, I'm happy about that. 
but it, your time would probably be better used instead of planning a, another protest to actually just help us get a whole lot of people there to the one that we already have going on. Um, and so sometimes it really is just being a good partner, listening to what people say when they say what they need and following through when you agree to do something. I also like to mention over and over and over again, lived experience is subject matter expertise. You all are a subject matter expertise in whatever you're here for. And um, you are best positioned to speak about the real world impact in that field. Um, don't undervalue that power. I think a lot of folks, especially who are newer to the advocacy realm, say, I've never done this advocacy before. What do I say? And you tell the truth. It's honestly not more complicated than that. This is really messing up my day job. Here's why. <laughs> um, because often it reveals something to the lawmaker or to the community that they just wouldn't have seen because they're not as close to it as you are. Next slide, please. And how you can help. Next slide. So as I just mentioned, you have a unique perspective. You can share your story and make a real impact. I have had meetings with lawmakers who have changed the course on an entire issue based on our conversation. We have one single transgender athlete last year and that transgender athlete at the high school level, transgender girl athlete at the high school level. She is someone we, uh, we love and talk to all the time. And she had meetings with lawmakers and we said, look, your laws are tar targeting one single person and they're looking you in the face right now. And that conversation changed minds. Um, and so you all can have similar strong impacts by just looking these people in the face and saying what you're doing is harming us and here's why. Um, you can write personal testimony. This is, if you're not into public speaking, there are ways to just write stuff and you don't have to you know, be on a mic, be on a camera. Uh, you can write an opinion piece or a letter to the editor. Community voices are really powerful. Um, there's a reason that people focus on this. It's because, you know, everyone knows what Equality Ohio thinks about this, uh, but they don't know what you think. And, you know, as it's someone with a unique perspective, sharing it really is helpful. And the same thing with those conversations with lawmakers. If you're, if you're like, I'm ready to go and I just don't know where to even begin, you can definitely reach out to us. I know, Adam, you also do this work. So, you know, you talk to Caracol as well, but, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us and we can help you kind of figure out what makes sense for you to start with. Um, often it's getting connected with a local group. I'll be honest with you. Like if you know there's a local pride group or if you know there's a local group working on the issue that you care about, uh, link up with them. Uh, because we talk to, chances are we talk to their leader, uh, leadership a lot, um, because like from just a, you know, uh, scaling perspective, talking to, you know, those community leaders is, is often how Equality Ohio helps disseminate information and gather information. Um, and so, you know, go to your local school board, go to your local groups, figure out what they're doing and help make it better. Next slide, please. Engage, I, I keep talking about the next slide before I get to that slide. So I just mentioned, but you can write with, to your lawmaker, you can meet with your lawmaker, you can send a letter on behalf of your team or committee members, um, engage with the community, join a coalition, spread awareness through op-eds and um, letters to the editor, donate to local groups. Money is really truly always helpful, especially to local groups who like 200 bucks can really kind of, that can matter. Um, so, you know, feel free to open your pocketbook. I encourage that. Five bucks matters too, to be clear. Um, lend your expertise to other partners. We often, you know, I actually was at an event last night where I talked to doctors who are going to potentially testify against this resolution to speak to some of the scientific inaccuracies. That is such a direct action that is so great and something that could only be offered by someone with an expertise. Um, and then galvanize your personal networks too. You, especially the folks in Ohio, please. Um, you know, you get your the folks around you to vote. You get your the folks around you to understand issues. You turn people who are generally supportive into people who are comfortable talking about these issues. That's there's a big difference in those two things. Um, and it's not because of any sort of moral hiccups. It's because I don't have an answer if anyone asks me a follow-up question. So I'm probably maybe not going to sit this one out, right? Um, so if they're able to answer that follow-up question or better understand these issues, they're also better able to explain them to their friends and family. Next slide, please. 
I think I'm nearing the end. Um, and so Equality Ohio, we have our We Say campaign. It's a campaign to basically take all of these prohibitions and censorship laws and turn them on their head and say, we're gonna do all the things that you are trying to not allow us to do. We're gonna say gay, we're gonna say race, we're gonna say black, we're gonna say trans, we're gonna say disabled. We're gonna talk about our problems. We're going to embrace diversity and we are going to be the antithesis of what folks uh, keep trying to force us into, which is this um, very stringent environment where people cannot speak about their lived experience. Next slide, please. Um, Ohio Can Play is the, is the campaign we have related to uh, transgender participation in sports. That um, athlete I just mentioned a few minutes ago, she has a great short documentary on the Ohio Can Play website. It's just ohiocanplay.com. It's beautiful. It makes me cry every time. Feel free to watch it. But you'll also find videos from um, at least 50, I think at this point, community members uh, saying just in under a minute why they support uh, trans participation in sports. And it's often just about why you have found sports to be valuable or why you think that an inclusive environment is important. It doesn't need to be that you have some particular anecdote related to transgender participation in sports. Uh, an example I always like to highlight is our, our policy manager um, made a video about how they were able to, they played soccer when they were in third grade, which allowed them to figure out that they're really bad at soccer. And everyone should have the right to figure out they're really bad at soccer. Um, and so it doesn't have to be, I'm a world-class athlete. It can just be about what something you learn during T-ball uh, or why you think it's important to, for everyone to have access to that. Because we want to bring the conversation back to where it is, which is you're talking about regulating children. You keep talking about the, these you know, professional athletes and these collegiate scholarship athletes, but what you're trying to regulate is the sixth grader on a, a softball team. And that's a whole lot different. Next slide, please. And this is Ember, the one I just mentioned. I continue to talk about the slide before it shows up. Uh, feel free to watch on your own time. I think it's about six or seven minutes. Next slide, please. And here's your homework. You didn't ask for homework, but I'm giving you homework. It's okay, it's easy. Um, ask candidates who are running for office right now what they're gonna do for LGBTQ community members and educate yourself on the candidates and issues on your ballot. Equality Ohio has a scorecard we put out, out about state, law, state lawmakers and statewide offices. Um, we are also putting on a candidate forum where you can submit questions to these candidates. I believe I sent uh, Adam a, a blurb that covers both of those things with links uh, that you'll also get in your updates. So you will have access to this information and get your friends and family to vote. I get it, it's not a presidential year. And also this is an existential year for our community. Um, and then in your community, like stand up to bullies. This is adults bullying children. We can't kind of lose sight of the big picture here, which is this is a group of adults harassing and bullying children. And young people are watching us and looking for leadership and looking for us to be standing up for them. Um, because right now they really don't feel very welcome here. They don't feel loved, <laughs> they don't feel appreciated. And so when the best thing you could do is give these young people love and appreciation. Check in on your state government, school board, but also your school board and city council, lots of school board nonsense, some school board good stuff. And we wanna celebrate that. Like uh, giving people good feedback is something that again, is, isn't always as mobilizing, but um, it is actually an important component. We often hear from, we're increasingly hearing that um, people are getting criticized for not doing the anti-LGBTQ stuff, but not necessarily getting the thank you for doing this or thank you for standing with us. And it's not that they need thank yous, they, they stand tall either way, but it's really helpful when their inbox is a half and half rather than just all hate mail um, for both their psyche as well as just the political energy around our movement at large. Um, but we can't track it all. We are a small ragtag team as much as we like to, you know, have a big bark. We, uh, we're, we're more chihuahua sized as an organization, so we really need the help uh, of more pairs of eyes and more people to show up to these local meetings to just keep track of what's going on. Um, and there are a lot of very coordinated efforts by uh, anti-LGBTQ activists to make trouble. And that trouble can best be sort of stomped out 
by local community members saying, no, not here, not where we live. And be the safe adult, just one affirming adult can save an LGBTQ kid's life. Uh, next slide, please. LGBTQ youth are 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt uh, with just one accepting and affirming adult. Here is the Trevor Project line. We also have been passing around wristbands around the state that just have the Trevor Project line as well as we say you are love. It's very important to mark yourself as a safe adult to talk to, particularly if you are not in a community that has a lot of um, outspoken advocates around. It can feel like a very lonely place and it can make a lot of help. Next slide, please. That's all I got. Thanks, Maria. We've got a couple of questions actually. Um, so we've got a question from someone in the audience that says, do you know anything about the new bill related to PrEP coverage and practitioners being able to claim that prescribing PrEP is against their religious views? I've seen a lot of headlines about this and would love for you to break it down. Yeah, so not a really fun answer to this question because the real answer to this question is we passed in Ohio, at least a, um, a, a medical conscience clause, they called it, which basically said, if you personally don't, um, you, if your religious or moral beliefs are against a certain um, treatment or medical um, service, you do not have to participate in it. And what that means is like doctors can turn away patients on the grounds that the treatment that they are asking for uh, doesn't align with their religious beliefs. And that is already unfortunately law in Ohio. We actually are, are trying to kind of study the impact of that law. Uh, so if you all actually have stories or um, information related to how you're seeing that manifest in the field, this is the first year that it's actually been the policy. So we're still assessing how rampant it is and how frequently this is being invoked. Um, but my honest answer is that, in, at least in Ohio, we already actually have the ability for folks to turn away healthcare services. Now, there also are legal challenges are also pending. So there are people fighting for this to not be um, the law of the land. But everything, what I've read about the HIV specific, the PrEP care that you're referring to, is similarly grounded in the legal um, basis of that medical conscience clause. And... Um, it's, uh, sorry, I read the comment and lost my train of thought. Uh, it sounds like it's using very similar legal legal theory. And so I imagine it will be challenged under similar uh, grounds that it's been challenged locally in the state. Thank you. Um, and then earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that there was a connection between abortion rights and LGBTQ rights. Could you talk a little bit more about what that connection is and how it um, is maybe potentially manifesting itself now that um, the Dobbs decision has come out. Yeah, I can. Um, so I like to describe case law, particularly civil rights case law, as a Jenga tower. Uh, and you know, that's the one you poke as many things out as you can and see how long it takes to fall. That's kind of how our civil rights work as well. And so the best way I can explain the legal rights of LGBTQ people, and that includes um, marriage equality and uh, the right to have um, sexual intercourse in any way that you please. Um, and the uh, right to not be discriminated against uh, on the basis of sex are all grounded in that right to privacy that I mentioned, and specifically Roe v. Wade is that linchpin case that was often used. And so I describe it as basically a, a Jenga tower where that Roe v. Wade was a really important piece in the tower. It was, we're a lot more wobbly now on everything. Every right that is based on that right to privacy is just a little bit weaker because there's one case that was a really important foundational base case for that case to be decided that has now been thrown out of that tower. Um, so that's how legally those cases are linked. And then I think from a, from a more moralistic, ideological perspective, it is that privacy right, how that privacy right manifests. Can someone as a lawmaker decide which medical treatment you should 
pursue. If there is a medical best practice treatment, does a lawmaker have the right to say you can't do that? And transgender medical care for young people is medical best practices. This is what scientists, doctors, people who study this and look at it for a living have decided is often the best course of care, not universally, but often the best course of care for individuals who are gender nonconforming. Does a lawmaker have the right to say, I don't care, you can't do it, even though it decreases suicide risk, even though it, it helps the physical health of these kids, you can't do it. Um, our answer would be no. But the same is true of, say, an ectopic pre pregnancy, a pregnancy that, you know, is uh, unviable and or threatens the, the safety or well-being of, of the parent. Um, also, you know, just uh, from a more general standpoint, you know, I personally in our organization believe that this is um, valid healthcare regardless of the context. I think that is important to stay, but I think often for the sake of sort of understanding these situations, it's, it is easiest to understand in, in the circumstance where um, the, uh, the fetus is not viable. Women or people have had to carry these non-viable pregnancies because a lawmaker decided that the medical breast practice treatment of removing um, that fetus, they're not allowed to do it. And it doesn't matter that that parent's health is more imminently in danger if they can survive it, it doesn't qualify as a, you know, a, a life um, carve out even these rape protections that still often requires verification through police. We know how often rapes go unreported. Having that requirement re basically requires us to, you know, more formally enter that bureaucracy regardless of what we think is best for our, you know, reality as a victim. Um, we would have to go through that because that's the only way we could get that exception met. And so it all comes back to, does the government have the right to decide on your medical care? Sorry, that was a long answer. No, that was that was great. Thank you for giving a little bit more information and context around that. Um, we have right now. We got one more question. Uh, so, when you were talking about the uh, decriminalizing HIV laws in Ohio um, and and the intent piece and that and that kind of thing, and you mentioned it's just getting rid of the kind of upcharge for the status. So, are there other laws that are already exist that deal with you know, um, communicable disease transmission that do, basically do we even need a law that is specific to HIV oh. or are there other laws that are, that already kind of deal with that? That's obviously going to, um, vary widely by the state that you're in. I recognize that everyone, not everyone on this call is in Ohio, but um, in, in the Ohio law that we're dealing with, it specifically mentions HIV. And so in this, and it again goes to the bias that was even, you know, sort of inserted when they passed the law to begin with, HIV is called out specifically. So all we're really asking for is for HIV to be treated like other communicable diseases. Um, and so um, it's, yes, the short answer is yes, it exists. And in our code, HIV is specifically put in a different section and we're trying to get it back to um, just being seen as another medical, um, you know, a medical health issue. Thank you. I think that is all the questions we have at right now. Let me just take one more check. Yep, we got them all answered. Maria, thank you for today. This was great information. Um, and I think our audience gained a lot of knowledge out of it. So thank you for being with us for uh, the final session of CARA Conference 2022. Uh, everybody in the audience, uh, if, again, if you're looking for continuing education credits, the links to the evaluations are in the chat and also the QR code in your PDF program. Uh, you will be getting uh, an email from us next week with some follow-up information, some of the links that Maria was talking about, and a uh, overall survey about your experience with the conference. And the certificates for the continuing education credits will be sent out via email uh, sometime next week 
uh, mid next week is is our goal. Uh, if you were um, looking for continuing medic medical education credits for the previous days of the conference, uh, reminder to reach out to uh, Mary Beth Donica. Uh, she's the one leading that effort. But again, thank you to the audience for being with us today and the whole week. We hope you got a lot of great education and enjoyed your time with us. And thank you to Maria from Equality Ohio for spending her lunch hour and afternoon with us. I really appreciate it.